Hello, sixth graders. Um, welcome to the last video lesson pre-recorded um, of the school year. Next week, we will have one more library time where we'll be meeting on Zoom. Um, next week, it's going to be all about summer reading. Um, I want you to come prepared with some recommendations, books that you've really loved. They can be fun and silly. It doesn't have any have to be anything too serious, but anything to keep you reading for the summer. Things that you've loved, I'm going to come with lots of books prepared to uh, talk to you about. Um, and um, and then we're, I'm just going to get started in, in just a minute. It's going to be, we've had a, you know, what a wonderful and strange year we've had together. Um, and I'm looking forward to being with you in person in seventh grade. I hope uh, we can have a lot of exciting times in junior high. So um, we'll meet together next week. A couple announcements before I get started with today's lesson. Um, one is that um, we're getting ready to return library books to school. Now, nobody's been on campus. Um, a couple of your teachers have been in here and out, here and there, you know, in and out. But um, for the most part, you know, we've all been at home. But there is going to be a day. Uh, Mrs. Haynes is preparing some information for your families that you will be getting in the next couple of days. Um, about returning materials and kind of exchanging materials that you have at home um, with you know some things that you have at school that you might need so um, hold tight for that but in the meantime I am posting a list of library books that you have checked out it is everything that every sixth grader should have checked out um, so take a look and start to look around your house I know for me I have plenty of books stacked up as you can see over there over here <laughs> that I've been using for teaching at home reading to my kids reading for myself um, and it's time to bring them back and we're gonna start getting the library ready for next year when hopefully we'll all be together in person so take a look at that list if you have any questions for me you can email me if there's anything that you have at home that is a high point library book um, I'm just gonna grab a book for a second and show you We have, um, how do you know, everybody knows, sixth graders, how you can tell if it's a High Point Library book. You might have books from the public library at your house, but just take a look. All the High Point Library books have that barcode with the name of the school on the back. Um, so if you're not sure, especially even if you see something, you don't see something on the list, every once in a while, you know, we make a mistake, especially if students are helping to check books in and out. There may be a book that didn't get fully checked out to you. Um, that you have at home anyway. So we're getting ready to bring books back. And now on to today's lesson. So we're going to read one more short story together. Um, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to read some really unique, um, unusual stories with you and specifically stories that are not written for kids. Um, you're sixth graders, you're about to be seventh graders, you're really sort of edging away from elementary school life and into literature that can be weird and wild and surprising and short stories are a really good opportunity to try out kind of you know different styles genres and see what's out there um, there's a lot that can be told in a few pages so the story we're going to read today is by an author that you, I'm certain that all of you have read in some form or another. Um, it's a story by Roald Dahl. Now Roald Dahl, we all know, um, has written, is well known for writing stories for children. He wrote Matilda and the BFG and the Witches and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and so many other fabulous, funny books that are weird and twisted and the adults are mean and cruel usually and the kids are smart and tricky and um, he wrote short stories for adults as well and boy are those stories weird um, I love them I read most of them when I was in high school and junior high school and they they were really they're written for adults um, some of them are not 
exactly appropriate for sixth graders, but some of them are, and they're amazing. And we're gonna read one today. Um, I've edited it a little bit for time because it's a little bit long. Um, the story is called Royal Jelly. And just like when we read um, Sound of Thunder, um, the book about hunting the dinosaur, um, when we read The Gift of the Magi about the couple who give each other the gifts that they have paid for by exchanging their prized possessions. Um, there's quite a twist in this story and it is a science fiction story and it is strange and unusual and here it goes. It is called Royal Jelly. Part one. It worries me to death, Albert. It really does, Mrs. Taylor said. She kept her eyes fixed on the baby who was now lying absolutely motionless in the crook of her arm. I just know something's wrong. The skin on the baby's face had a pearly translucent quality and was stretched tightly over the bones. Try again, said Albert. Oh, it won't do any good. You have to keep trying, Mabel, he said. Look, she said, standing up. You can't tell me it's natural for a six-week-old child to weigh less and less by more than two whole pounds than she did when she was born. Just look at those legs. They're nothing but skin and bone. The tiny baby lay limply on her arm, not moving. Dr. Robinson said that you were to stop worrying, Mabel, and so did that other one. Ha, huh, isn't it wonderful? I'm to stop worrying. Now, Mabel, what does he want me to do? Treat it as some sort of a joke? He didn't say that. Oh, I hate doctors. I hate them all, she cried, and swung away from him and walked quickly out of the room towards the stairs, carrying her baby with her. Albert Taylor stared, stayed where he was and let her go. A little while later, he heard her moving about the bedroom directly above his head, quite nervous footsteps going tap, tap on the linoleum above. Soon the footsteps would stop, and then beside the co uh, sitting beside the cot as usual, he stood staring at the child, and she was crying softly, refusing to move. Oh, she's starving, Albert, she would say. Of course she's not starving. She is starving. I know she is. And Albert? Yes. I believe you know it too, but you won't admit it. Isn't that right? Every night was like this now. Last week, they'd taken the child back to the hospital, and the doctor had examined it and told her that there was nothing the matter. It took us nine years to get this baby, Mabel said. I think it would kill me if anything should happen to her. That was six days ago, and since then, she'd lost another five ounces. But worrying wasn't going to help any, Albert Taylor told himself. One simply had to trust the doctor on a thing like this. So he picked up a magazine that was still lying on his lap and glanced idly down at the list of contents to see what it had to offer this week. And here's the table of contents. Among the bees in May, honey cookery, the bee farmer and the bee farm, experiences in the control of Nosema, late, the latest on royal jelly, this week in the apiary, the healing power of propolis, British Beekeeper's Annual Dinner, and Association News. So what can we tell from that story is that Mr. Taylor has an interest and a hobby of keeping bees. Part two. All his life, Albert Taylor had been fascinated by anything that had to do with bees. As a small boy, uh, he often used to try to catch them with his bare hands and go running with them to the house to show his mother and sometimes he would put them on his face and let them crawl over his cheeks and neck and the astonishing thing was that he never got stung, stung. As he grew older, his fascination with bees developed to an obsession and by the time he was 12, he had built his first hive. The following summer, he had captured his first swarm and two years later, by the age of 14, he had no less than five hives standing neatly in a row against the fence in his father's small backyard. Clearly, there was some strange sympathy between this boy and the bees, and down in the village, in the pub and the shops, they began to speak of him with a certain kind of respect, and people started coming to his house to buy honey. When he was 18, he rented an acre of rough pasture, and there he set out to establish his own business. And now 11 years later, he was in the same spot, but he had six acres uh, instead of one, 240 well-stocked hives and a small house that he'd mainly built with his own two hands. He had married at the age of 20, and apart from the fact that it had taken them over nine years to have a child, he had been a success. In fact, everything had gone pretty well for Albert until this strange little baby girl came along and frightened them out of their wits by refusing to eat properly and losing weight every day. 
he looked up from the magazine and began thinking about his daughter. This evening, for instance, she had opened her eyes and began the feed, and he gazed into them and seen something that frightened him to death, a kind of misty, vacant stare, as though the eyes themselves were not connected to the brain, but just lying loose in their sockets like a couple of small gray marbles. Did those doctors really know what they were talking about? One could always take her to another hospital, somewhere in Oxford, perhaps. He might suggest that to Mabel when he went upstairs. He could still hear her moving around the bedroom. He switched his attention back to the magazine and went on reading. He finished an article and turned over to the last page and began reading the next one. The latest on royal jelly. He doubted very much that there would be anything in that that he didn't know already. What is this wonderful substance called royal jelly? Um, all the old stuff, he told himself, but for want of anything better to do, he continued to read. Royal jelly is fed in concentrated form to all bee larvae in the first three days after hatching from the egg. But, but beyond this point, for those who are destined to become drones or workers, this precious food is greatly diluted with honey and pollen. On the other hand, the larvae which are destined to become queens are fed through the whole uh, of their larva period on a concentrated gel diet of pure royal jelly, hence the name. Above him, the bedroom footsteps had stopped altogether. The house was quiet. Royal jelly must be a substance of tremendous nourishing power, for on this diet alone, the honeybee larva increases weight 1,500 times in five days. This is as if a seven and a half pound baby should increase that in that time to five tons. Albert Taylor stopped and read that sentence again. He read it a third time. Mabel, he cried, come here. He went out to the hall and stood the, at the foot of the stairs for her to come down. There was no answer. Come down in a minute, please. I've had a brilliant idea. It's about the baby. Part three. The light from the landing behind him cast a faint glow over the bed and he could see her dimly now, lying on her stomach with her face buried in the pillow, her arms up over her head. She was crying again. Mabel, he said, going over to her, touch her touching her shoulder, please come down a minute. This may be important. Oh, go away, leave me alone. Oh, what time is it? Oh, Albert, she sighed. I'm so tired, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I can't go on, I don't think I can stand it. What time is her next feed, Albert said. Two o'clock, I suppose. And the one after that? Six in the morning. I'll do them both, you go to sleep. She didn't answer. You get properly into bed, Mabel, and go straight to sleep, you understand, and stop worrying. I'm taking over completely for the next 12 hours. You'll give yourself a nervous breakdown going on like this. Oh, Albert, she sobbed. Don't worry about a thing. Leave it to me. Albert, yes. I love you, Albert. I love you too, Mabel. Now go to sleep. Albert Taylor didn't see his wife again until nearly 11 o'clock the next morning. Oh, good gracious me, she cried, rushing down the stairs in her dressing gown and slippers. Albert, just look at the time I must have slept 12 hours last night. Is everything all right? What happened? He was sitting quietly in his armchair, smoking his pipe and reading the morning paper. The baby was in a sort of carry cot on the floor, sleeping. Hello, dear, he said, smiling. She ran over to the cot and looked in. She, did she take anything, Albert? How many times did you feed her? She's due for another one at 10 o'clock. Did you know that? Albert Taylor folded the newspaper into a square and put it on the table. I fed her at two in the morning, he said, and she took an ounce and a half, no more. I fed her at six and she did a bit better, two ounces. Two ounces, oh, marvelous. And we just finished the last feed 10 minutes ago. There's a bottle on the mantelpiece, only one ounce left. She drank three. How's that, he said, grinning proudly, delighted with the achievement. The woman got, wood, woman got down quickly on her knees and peered at the baby. Doesn't she look better, he said eagerly. Look at that face. It may sound silly, said the wife, but I actually think she does. Just like the doctor prophecies, I think she's turning the corner. Pray to God you're right, Albert. Of course I'm right. From now on, you watch her go. Uh, you just watch her go. The woman gazed lovingly at the baby. You look a lot better yourself too, Mabel. I feel wonderful. I'm sorry about last night. Let's just keep it that way. I'll do all the night feeds in the future. You do the day ones. Um, I'm gonna
skip over part. He's promised, he's, uh, she, she insists on, on doing the feed, but he's going to prepare the bottles. It's all mixed, he said. Everything's mixed and ready, and you've got to, uh, and all you've got to do when the time comes is go out to the larder and take it off the shelf and warm it up. That'll help some, won't it? The woman got off her knees and went over and kissed him on the cheek. Oh, you're such a nice man. She said, I love you more and more every day, you know. Later, in the middle of the afternoon, when Albert was outside in the sunshine, working among the hives, he heard her calling to him from the house. Albert, she shouted, Albert, come here. He started forward to meet her, wondering what was wrong. Oh, Albert, guess what? What? I've just given her the two o'clock feed and she's taken the whole lot. No. Every drop of it, Albert. Oh, I'm so happy. She's going to be all right. She's turned the corner, just like you said. She came up and threw her arms around his neck. Naturally, there was a certain amount of suspense in the air as the time approached for the six o'clock feed. By 5.30, both parents were seated in the living room, waiting for the moment to arrive. The bottle of milk formula was standing in a saucepan of warm water on the mantelpiece. The baby was asleep in its carry cot on the sofa. At 20 minutes to six, it woke up and started screaming its head off. There you are, Mrs. Taylor said. She's asking for the bottle. Pick her up quick, Albert. Hand her to me. Give me the bottle first. After she, they had uh, finished eating, the parents looked down. Isn't she the most beautiful child you'd seen in her life? Albert, she said after a while. Yes, dear. What was it you were going to tell me last night when you came rushing up to the bedroom? You said you had an idea for the baby? Albert lowered the magazine onto his lap and gave her a long, sly look. Did I, he said. Yes, she said, waiting for him to go on. What's the big joke? Why are you grinning like all that? Oh, it's a joke, all right, he said. Well, tell it to me, dear. I'm sure I ought to, he said. You might call me, a, I'm not sure I ought to. You might call me a liar. She had seldom seen him looking so pleased with himself as he was now, and she smiled back at him, egging him on. I'd just like to, uh, I'd just like to see your face when you hear it, Mabel, that's all. Albert, what is all this? You agree that all of a sudden she is feeding marvelously and looking 100% different? I do, Albert, yes. That's good, he said, grin widening. You see, it's me that did it. Did what? I cured the baby. Yes, dear, I'm sure you did, says Mrs. said Mrs. Taylor and went right on with her knitting. You don't believe me, do you? Of course I believe you, Albert. I give you all the credit, every bit of it. Well, then how did I do it? Well, she said, pausing for a minute to th think, I suppose it's simply that you're a brilliant feed mixer. And ever since you started mixing the feed, she's got better and better. Oh, well then, do you mean there's a sort of art in mixing the feeds? Apparently there is. I'll tell you a secret, he said. You're absolutely right. Although, mind you, it isn't so much how you mix it that counts. It's what you put in it. Albert, you don't mean to tell me that you've been putting things in that child's milk. He sat there grinning. Well, have you or haven't you? It's possible, he said. I don't believe you. He had a strange, fierce way of grinning that showed his teeth. Albert, she said, stop playing me with me like this. Yes, dear, all right. You haven't really put into anything into her milk, have you? Answer me properly, Albert. This could be such a serious thing with a tiny baby. The answer is yes, Mabel. Oh, Albert Taylor, how could you? Now don't get excited, he said. I'll tell you all about it if you really want me to, but for heaven's sake, keep your hair on. It was beer, she cried. I just know it was beer. Don't be so daft, Mabel, please. Then what was it? Part four. Albert laid his pipe down on the table beside him and leaned back in his chair. Tell me, he said, did you ever by chance happen to hear me mentioning something called royal jelly? I did not. It's magic, pure magic. And last night I suddenly got the idea that if I was to put some of this into the baby's milk, how dare you? Now, Mabel, you don't even know what it is yet. I don't care what it is. You can't go putting foreign bodies like that into a tiny baby's milk. It's perfectly harmless, Mabel. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. It comes from bees. I might have guessed that. Um, and how much did you give our baby last night, I might ask? Ah, that's the whole point. That's where the difference lies. I reckon our baby, just uh, in the last four feeds, has already swallowed about 
50 times as much royal jelly as anyone else in the world has ever swallowed before. How about that? Albert, stop pulling my leg. I swear it, he said proudly. She sat there staring at him, brow wrinkled, mouth slightly open. You know what this stuff costs, actually, Mabel, if you want to buy it. There's a place in America advertising it for sale at this very moment for something like $500 a pound jar. $500, that's more than gold, you know. She hadn't the faintest idea what he was talking about. I'll prove it, he said. Jumped up and ke- to where he kept his literature about bees and took down the latest issue of American Bee Journal and turned to a page of classified advertisements in the back. Here you are, exactly as I told you. We sell royal jelly, $480 per pound jar wholesale. He handed her the magazine so she could read it herself. Now, do you believe me? This is an actual shop in New York, Mabel. It says so. It doesn't say you can go stirring it into a milk of a, the milk of a practically newborn baby, she said. I don't know what's come over you, Albert. I really don't. Well, it's curing her, isn't it? I'm not so sure about that now. The point is this. It has done so much good for our little baby just in the last few hours that I think we ought to go right on giving it to her. Now, don't interrupt, Mabel. Let me finish. I've got 240 hives out there. And if I turn over maybe 100 more just to making royal jelly, we ought to be able to supply her all she wants. Albert Taylor, said the woman, stretching her eyes wide and staying in. Have you gone out of your mind? Just hear me through, will you, please? I forbid it. Absolutely. You are not to give my baby another drop of that horrid jelly. Do you understand? Now, Mabel. Do me a favor, will you? Let me explain some of the marvelous things this stuff does. You haven't even told me what it is yet. All right, Mabel, I will do that. But will you listen? Will you please give me a chance to explain it? She sighed, picked up her knitting once more. I suppose you might as well get it off your chest. He paused a bit uncertain. He wasn't going to explain as easily uh, something like this to a person without any detailed knowledge of ep- uh, apiculture at all. Apiculture, like an apiary, these are words that have to do with bees. So ap- uh, apiculture, apiculture is the study of bees. You know, don't you, that each colony has only one queen? Yes. And that the queen lays all the eggs? Yes, dear, that much I know. All right, now the queen can actually lay two different kinds of eggs. She can lay eggs that produce drones, and she can lay eggs that produce workers. Now, if it isn't a miracle, Mabel, I don't, if that isn't a miracle, I don't know what is. Yes, Albert, all right. The drones are males. We don't have to worry about them. The workers are females, and so is the queen, of course. Now, what happens is this. The queen crawls around the comb, laying her eggs in what we call cells. Uh, she lays one egg in each cell, and in three days, each of these eggs hatches out into a tiny grub. We'll call it a larva. Now, as soon as the larva appears, the nurse bees, they're the young workers, all crowd around and start feeding it like mad. Do you know what they feed it on? Royal jelly, answered Mabel patiently. Right, that's exactly what they feed it on. And they get this stuff out of their gland, a a, a gland in their heads, and they start pumping it into a cell that they feed the larva. You know what happens then? Royal jelly must be a substance of tremendous nourishing power, for on this diet alone, the honeybee larva increases in weight 1,500 times in five days. How much? 1,500 times, Mabel. Do you know what that means if you put it in terms of a human being? It means, he said, lowering his voice, fixing his, uh, his finger towards her with those small, pale eyes, it means that in five days, a baby weighing seven and a half pounds to start off with would increase to weigh five tons. Well, you mustn't take that too literally, Mabel. Who says I mustn't? It's just a scientific way of putting it, that's all. Very well, go on. Well, that's only half the story. The really amazing thing about royal jelly, I haven't even told you that. I'm going to show you now how it can transform a plain, dull-looking little worker bee to a great, big, beautiful queen. Are you saying our baby is plain-looking and dull? Um... Uh, she asked sharply, did you know that a queen bee and a worker bee, although they come from completely different, uh, they go, they are completely different when they grow up, are both act, hatched out of the exact same kind of egg? I don't believe that, she said. It's true as I'm sitting here. Anytime bees want to hatch a queen instead of a worker, they can do it themselves. How? Ah, he said, shaking a forefinger in her direction. That is just where I'm coming in. 
That is the secret to the whole thing. Now, what do you think, Mabel, that make, makes this miracle happen? Royal jelly, she answered. You already told me. Royal jelly it is, he said, clapping his hand, bouncing up on his seat, his big round face glowing with excitement. Two vivid patches of scarlet appeared high on each cheek. One gets royal jelly all the way through its larval life. The nurse bees simple, simply pour it into the cell. So much of it, in fact, that the little larvae are little, literally floating in it. And that's what makes it a queen. You can't prove it, she said. Don't talk so silly, Mabel. Thousands of people proved it time and time again. Famous scientists in every country in the world. All you have to do is take a larva out of a worker cell and put it into a queen cell. And just as long as the nurse bees keep it supplied with royal jelly, presto, it grows into a queen. Pretty hard to believe that a food can do all that. Of course, it's hard to believe. It's another miracle of the hive. You know something, she said, staring at him. Uh, but smiling all the same, you're getting to look a teeny bit like a bee yourself, you know? He turned and looked at her. I suppose it's the beard mostly, she said. I do wish you'd stop wearing it. Even the color is sort of bee-ish, don't you think? What are you talking about, Mabel? Do you want to hear any more about this or not? Yes, dear, I'm sorry. I was only just joking. Do go on. He turned the page again and pulled another magazine out of the bookcase and began leafing through the pages. Now, just listen to this, Mabel. Still and Burdett found that, um, oh, I'm going um, to skip along so that we can finish the story in time. Um, listen, I think the baby is crying. She must be hungry. His wife already looked at the clock. Good gracious me, she said. It's past her time again. You mix the feed, Albert, quickly. Well, I bring her down. I don't want to keep her waiting. In half a minute, Mrs. Taylor was back, carrying the infant, screaming in her arms. Do be quick, Albert, she said, settling in, pulling the armchair up to her. Please hurry. She hitched the baby's head in the crook of her arms and then pushed the bottle straight into its open yelling mouth. The baby grabbed it and began to suck. The yelling stopped. Mrs. Taylor relaxed. Oh, Albert, isn't she lovely? She's terrific, Mabel, thanks to the royal jelly. Now, dear, I don't want to hear another word about that nasty stuff. It frightens me to death. You're making a big mistake, he said. We'll see about that. Baby began to cry again. I bet she's still hungry. I bet she wants another swig of that bottle. How about fetching her an extra lot? I don't think we have to do that, Albert. It'll do her good, he said, getting up from the chair. I'm going to warm her up a second helping. He went into the kitchen and was away for several minutes and returned holding the bottle brim full of milk. I made her a double, he announced. Eight ounces, just in case. Albert, are you mad? Don't you know it's as bad to overfeed as underfeed? You don't have to give her the lot, Mabel. You can stop anytime you like. Go on, Stan uh, said, standing over her. Give her a drink. There you are, Mabel. What did I tell you? The woman didn't answer. She's ravenous, that's what she is. Look at her. Mrs. Taylor was watching the level in the bottle of milk, which was dropping fast, and before long, three or four ounces out of the eight had disappeared. There, she said, that'll do. Can't pull it away now, Mabel. Yes, dear, I must. Go on, woman. Give her the rest. Stop fussing. But, Albert, she's finished. Can't you see? Go, uh, go on. Go on, my beauty. You finish that bottle. I don't like it, Albert, said the wife, but she didn't pull the bottle away. Five minutes later, the bottle was empty. Slowly, Mrs. Taylor withdrew the bottle, and there was no time to protest from the baby, no sound at all. It lay peacefully on the mother's lap, eyes glazed with contentment, mouth half open, half open, lips smeared with milk. The woman was staring down at the baby, and now the anxious, old, tight-lipped look of the frightened mother was returning slowly to her face. Come here, Albert, she said. What? I said, come here. He went and, took a, uh, went and stood beside her. Take a look and see if you don't see anything different. He peered closely at the baby. She seems bigger, Mabel, if, you see, if, you, if that's what you mean, bigger and fatter. Hold her, she ordered, go on, pick her up. He reached out and lifted the baby off the mother's lap. Good God, she weighs a ton. Exactly. Now, isn't that marvelous, he cried, beaming. Bet she best be getting back to normal already. 
frightens me, Albert. It's too quick. Nonsense, woman. It's that disgusting jelly that's done it. She said, I hate the stuff. There's nothing disgusting about royal jelly, he answered indignant. Don't be a fool, Albert. If you think it's normal for a child to start putting on weight at this speed, you're never satisfied. You cried, you're scared stiff when she's losing, and now you're absolutely terrified because she's gaining. What's the matter with you, Mabel? Albert, she said. Yes. I assume there wasn't any royal jelly in that last feed you've given her. I don't see why you should assume that, Mabel. Albert, what's wrong, he said, soft and innocent. How dare you, she cried. Albert Taylor's great bearded face took on a pained and puzzled look. I think you ought to be glad she's got another big dose inside her, he said. The woman was standing just inside the doorway, clasping the sleeping baby in her arms and staring at her husband with huge eyes. She stood very erect, her body absolutely stiff with fury, her face paler, more tight-lipped than ever. You mark, my w uh, you mark my words, Albert was saying. You're going to have a nipper on there as soon as... Uh, Soon that'll win first prize in any baby show in the country. Why, don't you weigh her now and see what she is. Want me to get the scales, Mabel, so you can weigh her? The woman walked straight over to the large table in the center of the room and laid the baby down, quickly taking off her clothes. Yes, she said, get those scales. Then she unpinned the diaper and drew it away as the baby lay naked on the table. But Mabel, Albert cried, it's a miracle. Look, she's fat as a puppy. Indeed, the amount of flesh the child had put on since the day before was astounding. The small sunken chest with the rib bones showing all over it was now plump and round as a barrel, the belly bulging high in the air. Curiously, though, the arms and legs did not seem to have grown in proportion. Still short and skinny, they looked like little sticks protruding from a ball of fat. Look, said Albert, she's even beginning to get a bit of fuzz on her tummy to keep her warm. Now, think about, I'm, this is me talking here, I'm pausing for a moment. Picture this baby. The baby's getting rounder. The legs are kind of looking stick-like and skinny as it are its arms. Now there's kind of a fuzz on its stomach. What does this remind you? Don't you touch her, the woman cried. She turned and faced him, eyes blazing. She looked like some kind of frightening bird with a neck arched over him as though she were about to fly at his face and peck his eyes out. Now, wait a minute, he said, retreating. You must be mad, she cried. Um, I'm going to skip this part here. And he, he tells his wife that he's actually been tasting and and taking this royal jelly as sort of a dietary supplement for over a year. So he's saying, don't worry, it's safe for me to take Then You know, it must be fine for the baby. And here's another thing, he went on. It made me feel so marvelous, Mabel, and so completely different. Um, buckets, of them, buckets of it I must have swallowed during the, during the last 12 months. The big, heavy, haunted-looking eyes of the woman were moving intently over the man's face and neck. There was no skin showing at all on his neck, not even at the sides below his ears. The whole of it, to a point where it disappeared to the cover of his collar of his shirt, was covered all the way round with these shortish hairs, yellowy black. Now remember the description of him before, that he was looking a bit bee-ish. Think of what this may be doing to him. Mind you, he said, turning away from her now, gazing lovingly at the baby. It's going to work far better on a tiny infant than a fully developed man like me. You've only got to see her to look at her. Or you've only got to see her to see that. Don't you agree? The woman's eyes traveled slowly downward and settled on the baby. The baby was lying naked on the table, fat and white and comatose like some gigantic grub that was approaching the end of its larval life and would soon emerge into the world, complete with mandibles and wings. Why don't you cover it up, Mabel, he said. We don't want our little queen to catch a cold. And that's the end of the story. What did the royal jelly do to the baby? Has he turned his baby 
into a bee. What a strange story. Um, this is Roald Dahl at his most twisted and bizarre. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. It is definitely a unique and unique story. Um, love to hear your reactions when we are together on Zoom next week. And I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Have a good week, everybody.